dollar epic, the making of which was as outrageous and fantastic as the fabled hero who traveled to the moon, to the center of the earth, rode a cannonball, and fought a three-headed griffin, all before breakfast. <laughs> Baron Munchausen. seen a bit of it. Pull yourself together, that was only an excerpt. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a director, all of whose actors are united in one resolution, they'll never work for him again. <laughs> Terry Gilliam. That's a jacket to remember. Yes, I thought I'd throw all the TV sets in the country into, under the blink with this thing. People, people with astigmatism will be getting ill oh. all over the place. It's really frightening. Yeah. That, yeah. Now look, what about Sorry. that? Wasn't that beautiful? Oh, it's terrific. It's not the raucous humor that I'm used to doing, not the violence that people always accuse me of. It's beautiful. Well, that, that is beautiful. I mean, it, uh, the, the only criticism, as I said, have been from the people that you directed, saying they'll never work with you again, that you're mad. No, they, they did. They, they did. You've been reading Eric some... Idle, as, you Eric know, Idle reading. said you're mad. No, it's just that I have these ideas that need to be put on film somehow. And Eric was... Listen, Eric was the one that first read the script and said, it's wonderful, you must make a film, and can I play a part yeah. in it? So, after that, it's his own fault, not my fault. That's right. He said if he'd only stopped at, exactly. this is wonderful, <laughs> and not said, can I play a part, his life could have been happier. Yeah, well, fantasy isn't easy. It's hard work creating these incredible worlds. You know, 60 foot high people with detachable heads don't come easy or cheap, no. as you've already mentioned. 43 million buckaroonies. It wasn't my money, thank God. It nearly was, though, wasn't it? Yeah, there was one point they were threatening. It was really bad because uh, my wife was pregnant. We were in trouble uh, in, in Spain. And there were threats to sue me for fraud, misrepresentation, seize my assets. There were, at one point, we spent several weeks trying to get the house out of my name so that we had a place to live. And we were making a film at the same time. Well, I mean, how can you... You've got to be possessed to want to continue making a movie under those kind of circumstances. Yeah, the problem is once you start on these things, it's hard to stop. Actually, one of the things that kept me going at, at a particularly low point was Eric saying, you've got to do this film just to spite John Cleese. Because this is so far beyond anything John can imagine. He lives in a neat little world. He does, a neat, wealthy yeah. little world. We just saw in the papers yes. he's, he's sold out for about 30 million. Well, he it? needs the money. I mean, all the wives and everything. That's you know, true. goes on. Yeah. Yes. He lives a racy life, old John. Racy for a man that size. There's a lot of body oh, to race around on. Quite. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, tell us about Munchausen. Munchausen? Which particular bit shall we talk about? Well, no, about? no, just tell us about the Baron, because you've made this fantastic movie. Now, I understand the Germans didn't like it, because he's one of their heroes. Yeah, one of the... Well, it was a very odd one, because they, they... The film was made in, uh, during Nazi Germany. There was a version made by Mr. Goebbels. And um, it was the most expensive film at the time. I think they were trying to show off and show they could fight a war on several fronts and make the like most expensive yeah. film. Yeah. yeah, And they were actually pulling soldiers from the, the front to um, be extras in the film. It may be the reason we actually won the war, th that particular film. Yeah. So they didn't want to be reminded of it, I think. There was also another problem in Germany. They didn't allow kids to see it. And this is very unfortunate, since I made it for my daughters, and they wouldn't be able to see it in Germany. And uh, You made it for your daughters, but there's a lot of scary things in it, I mean. Yeah, but the great fairy tales do scare you. I mean, I, that's one of the things that bothers me about a lot of 
fairy tales now is they've taken the guts out of them. I, there was a version I read of, uh, to my daughter of, of Red Riding Hood, and the wolf didn't eat Granny. Granny hid in the closet. Yeah. The woodcutter wasn't daddy. He was daddy and not a woodcutter, and he yeah. chased the wolf away. And so there's hardly any point in it. I think fairy tales are great because they scare kids. And they get used to the fact the world is not all like Sesame Street. There's danger out there. And you fight these little battles over each fairy tale and you get stronger. That's and my theory. Yeah, but there were yeah. great dangers in making the movie because you, you took it to Spain, you took yeah. it to, to Italy, and you didn't speak either Spanish or Italian, which is not the best. Or English much of the time oh, as yeah. well. I mean, there, some of the English actors were complaining about this. Yeah. Yeah, it, was, it was very foolhardy, the whole thing, because... <laughs> I mean, I set out to do an impossible adventure. That was the whole thing. I was going to climb Mount Everest. I was tying one of my legs behind my back, you know, both arms there, bag over my head, and now let's climb Mount Everest, if you can find it. Yeah. And we started out like that, and somehow we managed to pull it off. The great thing is about the film that pleases me, despite all the pain and bloodshed and agony and the deaths, and you know, we won't mention the deaths, um, the, uh, we're, we're going to build a monument to the fallen in this film because some didn't make it. And some but didn't turn up either. That too. <laughs> and uh, one of the great things is none of this shows on, on, on screen. The whole thing actually looks wonderfully easy and delightful and a great romp. Yeah, but you, it, you gave it your life and your blood and, and your and actor's And Eric's blood. life, and Eric's life. What's yes, that I heard about people. you? You took the actors out to, to Italy, particularly, yeah. on one-way tickets so that they couldn't, couldn't get back. <laughs> and when you got out there, you had all their heads shaved. There was that, yes. <laughs> uh, well, let's see, they have to play several different ages in this film, from young men to old men. And rather than going around with those terrible bald caps, you know, those yeah, plastic yeah. things, in the middle of the hot Italian summer, where it's always coming loose, it's ter terribly uncomfortable, I convinced them it, the best thing would be shave your head. Yeah. And so we had this, this, this period, right at the start of the film, it was like warriors going into battle. And there they were, John Neville, Eric Idle, Winston Dennis, Charles McEwen, Jack Purvis. <laughs> It was wonderful. You actually knew who was in the film walking around the streets of Rome by the bald pates. And poor old Sean Connery was due to take a part, but he didn't take it because the extras wouldn't turn up or something. No, no, no. We had this sequence on the moon involving about 2,000 people with detachable heads. And <laughs> yeah. there was a point. There was a point in the film when we had to stop and re reconsider certain things. And we went from 2,000 people to two people with detachable heads. And one of those heads wasn't Sean's, and so he, he said goodbye, and we got Robin Williams in instead. Yeah, that's the thing that amazed me. You got John Neville, mm. who's a very distinguished actor, but not a box office name, yeah. to play the part of the Baron. You have Sting in it yeah. for about seven seconds. That's enough. <laughs> you have Robin Williams under an assumed name. Yes, yes. Do you care nothing for <laughs> Billy? Do you care nothing for your audience? It is a rather perverse way to make films, isn't it? Well, it's, I, I mean, sure. I mean, how come you get the money to make the film if you, if you do it this way? I don't know. I mean, I think by being as crazy as we've been over the years, they don't know what to make of us, and so they assume we must have something that they don't have, and so they keep giving us money. In fact, I, it is pretty, pretty odd, this one, because at the time we started to try to raise the money for this thing, I bumped into Mel Brooks. And I said I needed $25 million to make this film. And he said, what are the elements in it? And this is what they say in Hollywood. Elements are very important. And uh, I said, well, it takes place in the 18th century. It is an 80-year-old hero and an 8-year-old girl playing the lead. And he says, there's no chance. Nobody will give you the money. And now it's done. It exists. And it's wonderful. And it's, uh, it's great that even people like Mel Brooks, who are as crazy as that, didn't believe one could do it. I think it's, it's rather important to keep making keep pushing the parameters of what's possible in films, because I actually find most films now are more and more extended television. I mean, it's not that much different than what you can see on television, except you can drive a bit faster maybe in the films. And, and I've always wanted to make films that are like the ones I grew up with, all the great spectacles. But this, the great is a this is a tremendous fantasy. The Baron Munchausen, he rides cannonballs, he goes to the mm. moon, he goes to the center of the earth, he does all the most extraordinary, he, he makes a balloon out of ladies' knickers, of course. all that kind of stuff. I mean, don't we all? Well, that's what I was going to ask oh, you. So, how, how much of your fantasy is in this? I mean, is this your, your dreams? No, I mean, a lot of it is from the original stories, but things like, yeah, women's underwear to go to the moon is a special problem that I share with a few of the other actors in the group. Right, yeah. Um, and it's, but I don't see there should be any limitations to what you can do in films, and I, I, I like the idea of just going absolutely over the top, see how far we can go, see how many people we can drag in, amaze, astound, and... For a couple hours out of their lives, they get to live in other worlds. You had your last movie, Brazil. You had a lot yeah. of trouble with that as well. 
I mean, yes, it's I, to one, what, what do you think your future is as, as a, a film director? You go enormously over budget yeah. on this, $43 million. Brazil, you create trouble. Well, what think, do you think your future is? Well, I, again, I think, uh, I think I'm, I'm a big-time filmmaker is what they think. Anybody who can spend $43 million must be a big-time filmmaker, like, and they like employing them. That's like you <laughs> like Michael Cimino, bankrupt a studio and you get work it's forever. Crazy. I mean, I've actually got the next film going already. It's also another big-budget film. There's something... It doesn't make sense. I, for years, I thought that you had to be very careful, count every penny, stay under budget, and they would respect you and give you more money. It wasn't true. By spending it in vast quantities, they actually take you seriously. That's the secret. There must be, there must be millions of potential producers and directors out there saying, that's the answer. Do that's the future of movies. Do they watch the show? Producers and directors? Oh, yes, continually. And that's why your career is what it is today. Of course. Nowhere. <laughs> Terry Gilliam, ladies and gentlemen, and good luck to Darren Wilson.